Welcome back. This is part 2 of lecture 5. And we are moving on to estimating the empirics of illiquidity. So, as I already mentioned, uh, the story of the course so far is that in lecture number 2 we discussed empirical measures of illiquidity. So we talked about how to measure liquidity as an aggregate thing. It's total thing. And uh, ever since then, in the two and a half lectures since then, we have developed theories of how this liquidity comes to be. And we have proposed a few different explanations. So we talked about diverse selection, we talked about order costs, we talked about inventory risk. So a natural question now is, can we disentangle the um, contributions of these factors to market illiquidity? So what's the relative importance of all of these theoretical, so far, effects on the measures? So, in this uh, part, we will look at some empirical estimates that try to provide these answers. We have already made our first step towards this empirical estimation. Namely, uh, at some point, I believe it was in last lecture, lecture 4, we discussed the differences in dynamic impacts of uh, all these different factors. So, in particular, if you remember this graph, uh, it's, it was meant to be an illustration that order processing costs have a very short-lived effect that can be immediately reversed by the very next transaction. Adverse selection component uh, of illiquidity has a very permanent effect, which survives for a very long time. And inventory risk is somewhere in between the two. It has some medium-run effect, which uh, is very prominent in the short run, but it is uh, supposedly negated in the long run. Not in the sense that in the long run inventories does not matter, but in the sense that the contribution to inventory risk of any given transaction pertains to some extent over some small time, but vanishes in the long run. So the long run consequences of any given transaction are important. But obviously inventory risk is always a concern at any given point in time. So, to introduce some notation that we will use today, we will denote uh, as lambda the price impact that is related to information. So the adverse selection component of the um, price impact coefficient. Before we used lambda to denote the whole price impact coefficient, but simply because we did not have um, any other factors in our Kyle model. So now we'll use it to denote the adverse selection component, and we will use beta to denote the price impact coefficient related to the market maker's risk aversion. So beta is the part of the price impact that comes from uh, the inventory risk concerns. And you should not mix up these lambdas and betas with the lambda and beta that we had in our uh, Kyle model just in the first part of today's lecture. So this is a very different beta. This is not trader's aggressiveness. Finally, for our third factor for the order processing costs, we will use gamma to denote all costs that relate to, to this general class of costs. But this will effectively be a capture all component. So it will capture all the liquidity which is not explicitly explained by one of these two factors. So the kinds of data that we will be using today include um, transaction prices PT, obviously. We will use net market order flow QT to evaluate the price impact coefficients. And we will use order sign DT. We will probably not explicitly use um, the quote data, although it might be. I, I cannot remember all the papers by heart that we will look at today. But the idea is we will see how any given transaction of order size Q and sine D, uh, what is its effect on the prices of future transactions. So does this any given transaction have a short or medium or long running effect on future transaction prices? Just as we had in this graph here. So we will try to estimate this curve. 
So let's get into it. How can we do it? If we look at Ghost and Milgram model with inventory costs. Apologies, there was a typo there that I fixed in the background. So take Lost and Milgram model with order processing costs, not the uh, inventory costs. So what we had in that model, as we saw a couple of weeks, a couple of lectures ago, is that the price, the transaction price, PT, is given by the market valuation mu t plus the order processing cost component that depends on the direction of trade. So for buy orders, the price will be above the market valuation, while for sell orders, the transaction price will be below the market valuation. But this means that if we take the first difference, right? So th this this um, this equality per se is useless to us because we do not know what the market valuation is as the outside observers. But if we take the first difference, so if you look at not at the absolute level of prices, but if we look at the changes in the price level, so a delta PT, which is PT minus PT minus 1, this will be given by the change in market valuation, so the adverse selection component, so this uh, part embeds the information that was contained by the t minus 1 transaction, the transaction at time t minus 1. And we have here the, uh, in the order processing cost component gamma times delta dt. So you see that this component only enters if the uh, direction of trade switches from one period to another. So if the next trade is different from the previous one. And so we can also explicitly uh, write out this difference in the uh, change in the market valuation, which in the gloston milgram model is equal to this. So we, we had the market valuation at the beginning of period t minus 1. Then we have sum transaction, or sorry, I guess uh, our market valuations are evaluated at time at the end of period. So mu t is uh, market valuation at the end of period t, while mu t minus 1 is the market valuation at the beginning of period t, or equivalently at the end of period t minus 1. So at the beginning of period t we had market valuation mu t minus 1, then the time t order arrives, it has sign dt, so it's either an order to buy one unit or to sell one unit. Recall we're talking about the, the Gloston Milgram model. And so this order will uh, shift market valuation by this amount lambda times dt. So the market trade will convey some information about the uh, market valuation. It, 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 I guess this does assume that this impact is symmetric, so whether it is positive or negative, uh, the informational content lambda is the same, which is not necessarily actually true, even in the Gloston Milgram model that we saw. But we will just stick with it for simplicity. Uh, and uh, you can say that any other change in market valuation that does not adhere to this exact model is due to some error term epsilon t. And this can be, um, this can include all other kinds of public news as well. So once we plug in this market valuation expression into our expression for the first difference of prices, we will end up with this expression. So here you see that there are no market valuations in this uh, expression left. So there are no unobservable terms here except for the market valuation epsilon. So sorry, except for the noise term epsilon, which we will just impose some assumptions on, like zero mean is the standard one. Uh, but apart from this noise term, we only have the observable variables here. So we have the first difference in prices. We have the adverse selection component, which depends on 
dt on the direction of current trade. And we have the order processing cost component, which depends on the changes in the direction of trade. So this is the difference on the dependence of dt that will allow us to estimate it. We will use to uh, estimate these two components separately. And just to remind you here, for the time being, we do not have any inventory costs. So we are just trying to disentangle these two. And uh, when I say we, I mean Lost and Harris, who were among the first to attempt this. In particular, they evaluated this uh, regression, which is the same regression as we just saw, except for uh, in, in addition to the directions of trade, delta dt and just dt, they also include trade volumes, so delta qt and just qt. So these quantities qt are obviously absent from Gloston Milgram model, but it is reasonable to include them in the regression. So the, uh, they proceed with the estimations with the estimation in two stages. Uh, firstly, they find that gamma 1 and lambda 0 are both 0. Apologies. Um, in particular, this term is absent, meaning that the inventory, sorry, the order processing costs are independent of the quantity traded. They only depend on the, uh, on the direction of trade. So whether it is the buyer paying this cost or the seller paying this cost effectively. But quantities do not matter, which is something that we probably expected. Furthermore, this term is zero because lambda zero is estimated uh, to be zero. This means that the direction of trade does by itself not convey any information uh, about the market valuation of the asset, about the fundamental value of the asset that can be incorporated in market valuation. But rather, all this information is purely conveyed by the quantity QT. This is once again reasonable, right? If you think about the Kyle model that we have just seen, the price impact equation there was linear in QT, but there was no discontinuity at zero. So there was no difference between very, very small positive trade and very, very small negative trade. A very small buy order and a very small sell order. They do not convey significantly different pieces of information. So this is also a very reasonable finding. And once uh, they have found this to be the case, that these two coefficients are not statistically different from zero, they estimate a second regression, just setting these two coefficients to zero exogenously, and they just estimate gamma zero and lambda one, and they uh, estimate them to be these coefficients. So gamma zero is 0 0.04 and lambda one is 0 0.01. Here it's difficult to compare these two coefficients because uh, it's not 100% obvious what the quantity traded uh, is measured in. So what's the scale of this variable? But both of these um, are positive and significant and just they, they fit into our model of the world quite nicely. So I don't think it makes uh, much sense to continue comparing them. However, this paper is, uh, has some issues, like most old empirical papers before the wide spread of uh, vast amounts of data and computational power. So this paper does not use much data. It uses some transactions uh, from New York Stock Exchange from early 1980s, but I think the number of observations is ridiculously small, uh, maybe a few hundred which is very, very little for finance. The specification by itself is not 100% solid, and the estimation procedure is neither. So in particular, this two-stage estimation procedure in which you first identify which coefficients are zero, and then you estimate the remaining coefficients, does seem a little dubious to me, but 
I am not an expert in econometrics, so um, maybe it is fine. I do not think it is fine, but I might as well be wrong. Finally, this uh, paper only estimated the two factors underlying illiquidity. In particular, it was ignoring inventory costs. And if you try to add inventory costs to that specification that we just saw, you will see that they cannot be feasibly disentangled from adverse selection component. In particular, in the short run, the effect of market maker risk aversion would be similar to adverse selection in that uh, instead of this one price impact coefficient lambda due to adverse selection, you would have the joint price impact coefficient, the sum of the two price impact coefficients stemming from adverse selection and the inventory cost components. So this means that lambda and beta, these two coefficients, are not separately identified. You cannot figure out which share of this uh, 0 0.01 is due to adverse selection, which is due to inventory costs. So we have to come up with something new. And here by we, I mean of course other researchers that I will do that, I will use that convention throughout this lecture. Hasbrook, in 1988, showed that order flow is autocorrelated, or argued that order flow is in fact autocorrelated, meaning that the part of the order is not news, but it only moves inventory. In other words, the directions of trade, and maybe to some extent the quantities of the trade, are not independently distributed over periods. If you think about, um, and, and this is one of the criticisms that we, uh, that we express towards the Gloucester Milgram model, right? If there is one investor who splits a large order into a few small orders, then it's like it's immediate that the consequently, the consequent small orders following one another will be of the same sign. Their signs are not independently distributed. And this is something you observe in the real world. Of course, not every trade is a split part of some large trade, but uh, so there are some independent orders and there are some split orders. And these split orders, they add up some positive degree of autocorrelation to an otherwise uncorrelated order flow. So we end up with some positive degree of autocorrelation in the order flow. And so later Juan and Stoll used this specification to uh, attempt to estimate all three components of uh, the of the spread. In particular, these researchers assume that uh, order size QT follows an autoregressive process of order one, meaning that QT is given by um, some function of QT minus one with coefficient phi less than one plus some pure innovation eta t. Using this specification of the model, they do all the same derivation that we did uh, to infer that the first difference of prices will be given by this expression. So if you're interested in how to derive it, the slides do have this derivation, but I will not go through this in great detail. So if you're interested, you can pause the video or you can download the slides uh, from my website and the link in the description and uh, just go through it on your own. So these are the two slides of the derivation that I am not going through. Let us, however, analyze what exactly, how exactly this, uh, this expression has changed. So what does this assumption of non-IAD, but rather autocorrelated order flow, gives us in terms of our uh, estimated equation? Here you can see that the inventory risk component, beta QT, depends on the whole order size in period T, because this is the change in inventory, right? The whole order size affects the inventory. At the same time, if you look at the adverse selection component, so the terms that include lambda, 
you will see that lambda only depends on qt minus phi qt minus 1. So lambda only depends on this unexpected component of the order flow, the eta t. And this is exactly something that you should uh, expect of the adverse selection, right? So it, this, it only depends on the actual news, on the unexpected part uh, of whatever variable you're looking at. And in particular, this expression allows us to disentangle lambda and beta and to estimate the two variables separately. This is exactly what they did in the paper, and they estimated this equation for 20 major stocks at New York Stock Exchange, presumably using some uh, data from early 90s. And they obtained this, uh, these results. So firstly, surprisingly, they discovered that autocorrelation in the order flow is not positive, but rather negative. Meaning that the main driving force behind the uh, autocorrelated order flow is not so much the order splitting, so or, or otherwise the split orders do not follow each other, which, now that you think of it, is probably would probably defeat the purpose, right? Because whether you trade a large amount in one go or trade small amounts at, at almost the same time, the outcome is equivalent. Right? The whole point of splitting your order is to allow the market to regenerate a little bit, to exploit the resiliency of the market to, and to allow the prices to revert back to, to the baseline before you submit another small order, rather than just exerting this constant pressure on prices until your full order is executed. So splitting orders is not the main driving force in uh, order autocorrelation, but rather uh, this exact opposite happens. So the dealers desire to immediately unwind any inventory they ended up with is closer to the truth. So if the dealers bought one unit uh, at this very minute, the next trade in the next trade, they will try to sell this one unit of the asset rather than buying a second one. Right? They will always try to uh, quote prices, which will incentivize the market to take any inventory of the dealer. And this is probably what leads to negative order autocorrelation. But speaking of the spread components, these are the shares that they estimate. So in particular they will see, they, uh, they, they get that order costs account for over 60% of the spread. So illiquidity is mainly driven by order costs and not by any of the two interesting effects. However, one third of the spread is driven by dealer's inventory concerns, so a quite a significant amount. And 10% of the spread is driven by the adverse selection component, so by the information contained in the order flow. And 10% is a lot less than the share of this course that we devote to adverse selection, but given that this is still a sizable component and probably the most non-trivial component, this is what we will, uh, what will justify our exploration of the adverse selection further. Moving on, Madhavan, Richardson and Romans in the same 1997 estimate these, uh, the heterogeneity between the, contr the contributions of these different factors to the spread over the trading day. And what they find is that lambda, the adverse selection component, is stronger in the morning, so the larger share of the spread is attributed to adverse selection in the opening hours of the trading day, while in the closing hours, gamma is higher. So the closing hours are mostly driven by order processing costs.
this may um, um, the story that we can tell here is the story that does not talk about the order processing cost so much, but actually about the inventory risk and the relative balance between adverse selection and inventory concerns. In particular, you can say that in the morning, the trades reveal all the information that was accumulated during the off-market hours. So the fact that markets shut down for 16 hours a day does not mean that information stops being generated in these off-hours. In particular, stocks of all the same companies or of, or of many of the same companies are still traded elsewhere in the world and uh, there are some news being generated by markets elsewhere in the world. Meaning that by the time the market opens, a lot of information has been accumulated and it needs to be revealed. It needs to be incorporated into prices. At the same time, uh, the in the evening, a whole different force is in play. In particular, evening trading is quite often driven by traders' desire to close their open positions. So what happens is traders um, can accumulate quite significant positions during the trading day, but they uh, try hard to unwind these positions towards the end of the trading day. And a good reference here is one of the very recent papers. It is uh, still not published, to the best of my knowledge, at least at the point that I'm recording this. But Pogoslavsky and Muravyov have this working paper at which they look at the closing auctions and the closing prices of trades. And what they find uh, by looking at NICE and NASDAQ data is that even though closing auctions, which happen in the last 15 or 30 minutes of the trading day, account for over 7% of the daily trading volume, they contribute literally nothing to price discovery. So there is a lot of trading happening in the evening, and all of it is very uninformative. But this trading does create a significant pressure on prices, and closing prices in any given day deviate a lot from mid-quotes. So there is a lot of price inefficiency accumulated in these closing auctions. But this, um, but this inefficiency, this price inefficiency, is quickly eliminated in the morning. So if there is some after-hours trading or uh, opening trading in the very next day, this trading reverts these prices back to the mid-quotes, to the market valuation that was established before the closing price auction. So these closing auctions are mainly driven by the inventory concerns, right? And um, basically traders want to unwind their positions and no matter what it costs them, they do not want to carry these positions with them overnight. And uh, at the end of the lecture I will give you one reading, one case that deals with, it, with exactly this. Moving on, one other estimate of all these components is uh, due to Lyons from 95, and he uses data from foreign exchange markets and looks at dealers' inventory explicitly. So not just at price movements, but uh, he has data on how inventory of some dealer, I cannot remember whether it was one dealer or many dealers, and how this inventory changes and how prices change with this inventory. And obviously this is a very good way to find uh, out how large the inventory concerns are. And he found out that they are quite sizable. So inventory concerns are something that actually exists, at least for this particular dealer in this particular market. Hasbrook in 91, so we're going a little back in time, used a slightly different dynamic approach and uh, in particular estimates the kind of impulse response of prices to trade. And this is closer to the idea that we had at the very beginning with that graph. So you take one trade 
and you estimate how it moves prices, the price of the next trade, the price of two trades of, uh, in, in the future, the price of uh, trade, which is five trades in the future, and so on. So you estimate the impact of order at t plus 1 on the prices. And this effect on prices given by pt for some future trade minus uh, the price of the previous transaction. And this is what's called the impulse response or the impulse response function, if you take it as a function of capital T. He finds that uh, there is quite significant short run effect of a trade, and it's on the order of magnitude of 2%, but the long run effect is significantly smaller, meaning that once again the order processing costs are quite a significant component of um, the price impact or of the trading costs. And what, we, uh, what he means here by long run effect of a trade is uh, actually ridiculously short run. So even after five trades, the price effect is uh, cut down by one half. And five trades, you know, in uh, very liquid high capitalization markets can happen within milliseconds. So this is the time scale that we are talking about. But of course, this long run impact uh, is, first of all, longer run. And it is also greater for stocks with lower capitalization and those that are less liquid. Simply because they are generally more prone to adverse selection, relatively speaking. And this observation confirms uh, that, that conjecture, that hypothesis. Uh, another paper by four authors, Easley, Kiefer, O'Hara, and Paperman, try to estimate the absolute magnitude of informed trading, or the magnitude of adverse selection in markets. In particular, they use Gloss and Milgram type model to estimate what is called uh, the probability of informed trading, often abbreviated by PIM, I believe probability of in formed trading with no letter for trading. So how does this work? Uh, their model is a um, resemblance of Gloucester Milgram, but it, it, it specifies some explicit assumptions on the arrival process of different traders. In particular, this arrival process is uh, not just IAD, but it's slightly more elaborate. And uh, the story is such that there are trading days and on any given trading day with some probability alpha there is some information event. And with other probability 1 minus alpha there is no information event on any given day. This information event can be good or bad and it is only observed by informed traders. So basically, informed traders may or may not get to learn the fundamental value of the asset uh, today, or they get to learn the innovation to the fundamental value of the asset on any given day. And the probability that they do get to learn it is alpha. But uh, as in Gloucester Milgram model, no other market participants get to observe this information. None of them get to see this information event. So the dealer does not see it, and the uninformed traders also do not see it. So, so far, it's not really any different. Uh, but the more elaborate arrival process is as follows. They assume that within the day, traders arrive at the market according to a Poisson process. In particular, arrival arrivals of any given class of traders, which include uninformed traders, sorry, informed traders, the uninformed sellers, and the uninformed buyers, which are now split into two separate groups. So traders of each of these three different types arrive at the market according to a Poisson process, to, to an independent Poisson process. And the intensities of three processes are 
constants and given by these epsilons. So informed traders arrive to the market according to a Poisson process with intensity epsilon i. Uninformed sellers arrive to Poisson process uh, arrive to the market according to a Poisson process with intensity epsilon s. And for uninformed buyers, it's epsilon b. So then, um, just to remind you how Poisson process looks like, the probability of observing n traders of a particular type. So one of these three is the type that we are interested in. And the probability of observing n traders of a given type over the course of the trading day is given by this value. So what they do is they have data from No, sorry. Um, if you have data on the number of trading days, and you think that on some of these days there are information events, and on some of these days there are no information events, then what you have is on the days when there are no information events, you only have the uninformed sellers and buyers in the market. When there is a good event, the informed traders get to uh, buy the asset. They want to buy the asset. So the buy orders are coming from the informed traders and the uninformed buyers, while the sell orders only come from the uninformed sellers. And vice versa, when the information event is bad, then the informed traders sell the asset. So you have three types of day, and there will be different shares, different ratios of buy to sell orders on these three kinds of days. And so using that, you can estimate these three variables and alpha. In particular, so one way you can do it is by using maximum likelihood. And uh, in a follow-up paper, is the Vitkier and O'Hara estimate uh, this probability of informed trading. So in particular, the value that they are interested in is, is this pin. And it's given by the probability that there is an informed trader, that any given trade comes from an informed trader, which is given by this. So the probability that there is an informed informational event today, and this trade comes from an informed trader, epsilon i, divided by the probability of observing trade, well, any trade, which is given by epsilon b plus epsilon s plus this probability from uh, of observing trade from an informed trader. And they estimate this probability of informed trading using New York Stock Exchange data from 83 to 98, so quite a large data set. And they get that median across, uh, across assets, across stocks, this median probability of informed trading is about 19%, so about one-fifth of all market orders are coming from informed traders. And to get you a sense of the distribution of a cross-section of these pins, for 90% of the stocks, this probability of informed trading is between 10% and 30%. So it's very homogeneous across stocks. I guess a factor of three is not a very homogeneous, but I would say that 10% and 30% are generally not too far from each other. However, for many 10% of the stocks, the probability of informed trading can be very extreme. In particular, for very small capitalization stocks that are not frequently trading, uh, the probability of informed trading is much larger. Further, this probability of informed trading is positively correlated with spread and price volatility, which you can perceive as confounding factors with uh, small capitalization stocks. So the smaller is your stock, the more rarely it is traded, which can be a consequence or just a correlating factor. The, le the less known your firm is, the less trade there is, and the fewer uninformed traders are attracted to this stock. So the more of the trading is due to informed traders, 
who try to capitalize on your small capitalization stock. Uh, a bit later on, Gramic, Shirek, uh, and Tyson also uh, do their separate investigation into probability of informed trading, and they find that this pin is higher when markets are more anonymous. The intuition behind this observation is that in the anonymous markets, it is more difficult for traders to gain a reputation to gain bad reputation in particular, where bad reputation means the reputation of an informed trader, of an insider. If your counterparty knows that you are informed, you will get very uh, unfavorable prices. So if you have a chance to avoid having this reputation, you are more uh, interested in trading and you also have more market access at the same time. So you have more market access and you are more willing to use it because your trades will not contribute to your bad reputation. So when, more mar when markets are more anonymous, informed traders are more excited to, uh, to trade in this asset. So this observation was supported by these authors. And this pretty much concludes our discussion. So we'll learn today that, firstly, depth of the market is closely tied to liquidity and is determined by most of the same factors as liquidity is. So adverse selection, inventory costs, and order processing costs. Kyle model is a specific model that helps us analyze how market depth can respond to adverse selection. But more generally, it can accommodate all factors simultaneously. And then some. So we have not even mentioned the version of the Kyle model with uh, order costs. And this is probably the most difficult extension of the Kyle model, because then you, when you have the discontinuity at zero for the prices faced by the traders, then the whole nice normal distribution structure of the model that we exploit heavily breaks down. And so you no longer have the nice distributions that you can exploit. So order costs are difficult to explain within Kyle model, but you can explore market power by any parties, you can explore, explore inventory risk, and you can obviously explore adverse selection. And we only looked at the version with adverse selection, and the textbook considers some other versions as well. And in the second part of today, we used all of, the, all of the things we learned in the past few lectures to see how you can estimate the importance of different components of the spread. And the main takeaway here is that order costs are by far the largest cost, at least as estimated on major stocks. And there is some skepticism that you might keep in mind in, in respect to this observation. Namely, we used order costs as this catch-all component, right? So the fact that some part of illiquidity was classified as belonging to order costs, as being driven by order costs, means that it might be because we have not discovered a factor that explicitly explains that part of the spread. So order costs is a very ab abstract and general class of uh, costs. And it might include a lot of different things. Both inventory risk and adverse selection, on the other hand, have smaller but still significant contributions to illiquidity. Adverse selection, in particular, uh, contributes to maybe about 10% of the spread. But it is more of an issue in small capitalization stocks. And about maybe one-fifth of the trading in even major stocks is due to informed traders. Now, this is the blog post that I promised you. And this is a story of how the oil price became negative uh, in the spring of 2020. 
which is strictly speaking chronologically after this lecture was original was originally given. So you get one perk of this being a re-recording. And this is basically a story of how um, everyone was so constrained by their inventories, physical actually inventories, of oil and oil storage, that someone was willing to sell oil at negative prices. So they had to pay this uh, the buyer to take the oil off of them. Just simply because this trader had nothing, did not have any opportunity to deal with this oil. And this blog post gives you a more detailed perspective of how this happened and why this happened. Furthermore, you can look at the textbook, chapter 4, namely for a lot of different exercises on the Kyle model. As I said, it's very extendable, so you're more than welcome to look at the textbook if you, if you have access to it. To see more variations of the Kyle model, and um, you're more than welcome to, to look at the exercises to practice in approaching Kyle model. Next week, we will finally move on from dealer markets to limit order markets, and we will look at how they are different and uh, how how we can design them. So what what is the heterogeneity in these market structures? and how we can exploit this heterogeneity to achieve the outcome that we as regulators or as traders prefer. I will see you then. Goodbye.